Elmo really wants to eat both cookies. But he could give one to Cookie Monster. Then Elmo would still have a cookie and everyone would be happy. Enough is a powerful word. Uh, we, we talked about um, enough stuff a couple weeks ago. We had a couple boxes up here, and we talked about how we don't want to keep our eyes focused on our box or someone else's box, but the hands of God, who's the giver of every good gift. But that all of us, when it comes down to it, we have enough stuff to be able to share from what we have. And, and I even gave a challenge to, to everyone here to think about every day for 30 days to give something away. I heard about a couple who made a decision to do it a little differently. Day one, they gave one thing away. Day two, they gave two things away. Day three, they gave three things away. And by day 31, they were giving 31 things away each. Younger couple without a lot of stuff. And you know what they found out? They had enough stuff to give away that much stuff. You don't realize until you start giving stuff away how much stuff you actually have. And then, and then last week, we talked about enough distractions and how we live in this world with beeps and buzzes and tweets and, and stuff coming our way all the time. And how what matters most in all the world is loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving our neighbor as ourself, and getting that right. And if all the distractions get in the way, then we're missing what matters most. As some of you went back to the Connection Center after the service to pick up these technology parent conversation guides, we have them for preschool, elementary, middle school, and high school, and we had run out. So there's more back there if you need those today, and we have this all online for an electronic download. And so we encourage you to keep having those conversations. You know, enough stuff, enough distractions, and today we're talking about enough to share. We're getting practical and saying, God, have you, been, have you been good to me in such a way that I actually have enough to share? And, and here's my question for you today. Who here has enough to share something with somebody? What's the answer? Everybody. Everybody. Because generosity and sharing is, is more about the condition of our heart than how much we have. Generosity is about, about deciding to live the life that Jesus has put before us. And so I want to think together about the practice of sharing. If you're a note taker, you can write that down in that first spot there, the practice of sharing. And I want to give you four words under the practice of sharing that will help you think through what is a biblical practice of sharing. And the first word is found in Matthew 6, verse 2. In Matthew 6, verse 2, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching to this crowd of people. And we read this in Matthew 6, 2. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. And Jesus goes on to say, don't make a big show about it. He talks about kind of how to give. But you know what he's presuming in this passage? That his people will be generous. He says, and when you give to the needy. He doesn't say, if you give to the needy. He says, When. He's talking about how you do it, because he's just assuming if you're his follower, that's what we do. God's people share. God's people are generous. It's the way that God has made us. It's what we do. And I think early on in my Christian life, the person who showed me Jesus the most was a guy named Doug. And he shared his car, he shared his time, he shared his words, he shared his life. As a non-believing high school kid, I met this college guy who just opened his life and shared. He drove me from place to place, never asked me for gas money, just shared. And I, and I saw Jesus for the first time in the life of Doug Drainville. We need to become those kind of people. So your, your first word, if you're writing out four words under that topic of the practice of sharing, is when. Not if, when. The question is, when are you going to do it? Now here's the reality. You can't meet every need of every person in the world. 
If you say, well, okay, then, then I'm going to meet every need I see. You, that's all you'll be doing all day long, and you'll drop dead. So when is it right? When is the right time? Here's the answer. When God calls you to. So when you see a need, you pray and say, God, is this need for me? So how am I supposed to know? God will whisper. God will nudge. God will prod you. God will give you a little push. And there's kind of many times where you're just going to feel this conviction. This one's for me. Then you meet that need. <clears throat> Next time you go, you mean there's going to be a time where I see a need and I notice the need and I'm not the one to meet it? Absolutely. You know why? Because that's God's business. But he calls us into his business as his partners. We are God's business partners. We partner with God in the work of sharing and serving the world. So you see a need, Lord, is this one for me? And if you feel like God says yes, then act on that. And if you don't feel God prompting you to do it, move on because God will bring someone else to meet that need and he will show you what need you're to meet. But it's when you give to the needy, not if. Second, under the practice of sharing. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews 13, beginning in verse 15 and following, uh, we have this, this amazing passage. And I want you just to listen to this because another word's going to surface in terms of the practice of sharing. Hebrews 13, beginning in verse 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So praise God, pray to God, sing to God. That's praising him, but it goes on from there in verse 16. And do not forget to do good. You know you can forget to do good? I, I mean to do good, but I got into the day, I just forgot. I didn't notice. I didn't... They didn't do any good today. Do not forget to do good, and listen to this, and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Write down the word pleased or delighted. That word pleased can mean pleased. With, with, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. God is delighted. Do you know that it brings pleasure and delight to the heart of God when we're generous, when we share? I want you to picture a mom. This mom has two toddler kids, Jimmy and Sarah. Jimmy's one year older, and then Sarah, one year younger. And she's trying to teach them to be generous. She's trying to teach them to share, as every parent does. But Jimmy's a year older, so Jimmy kind of is, is supposed to know better. So, so a thousand times, Jimmy has heard words like this. Jimmy, Jimmy, honey, don't you want to share with your sister? And every time, she gets the same response back. No. I don't. So, so mom puts some food out for them to share, and she looks back, and it's all gone, and Sarah hasn't gotten any. Jimmy ate it all. Jimmy, Jimmy, don't, don't you, but don't you want in your heart, don't you want to share with your sister Sarah? But he doesn't. He doesn't want to share. He doesn't share. And so she asks, and she prods, and she cajoles, and she pressures, and she tries to, she's trying to change his heart, but, it, but it's hard to change a heart. And so Months go by and a few years go by and she's watching her son and her daughter and she's just hoping something will happen. And then one day, she's driving in the minivan and Jimmy and Sarah are in the, in the middle seat. They're buckled in, their car seats. It's kind of a cold day, so they both have their own little blankets kind of covering their laps. And they stop at a light. So mom takes the mirror as moms do and she kind of does the adjustment and checking things out. And she notices that Sarah's blanket has fallen off of her lap and it's kind of cold in the, in the van. And she looks over at Jimmy and Jimmy's blanket's still on his lap. And she's about to say for the thousandth time, Jimmy, don't you want to share your blanket? Jimmy, don't you want to help your sister with her blanket? But before she can say anything, she looks in the rearview mirror and she watches her little boy look over at his sister and then with one hand take his blanket off himself and reach over and just drape it over his sister's legs. And she begins to weep. Tears of joy. He gets it. It's the first glimmer, the first glimpse she's seen of her little boy sharing with her little girl who she loves. And she's delighted. She's delighted at that moment. Now understand something. She loved Jimmy before he shared. She doesn't love him anymore, but she's delighting in a way she's never delighted before. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, can I tell you something about generosity, something about sharing? We're not saved because we're generous. We're not saved because we give or we share. We're saved because God is generous. And he sent his only son to die for us when we didn't care about him. I and mean, we're saved by grace. We're saved because of the generous love of God. Because Jesus gave his life on the cross and rose again and offers that for us. And so, so we're not saved by works. We're not, you, you can be generous or not generous and that's not about salvation. Listen closely. We're not loved by God because we're generous. God doesn't say, oh, you're more generous, I love you more. You're less generous, I love you less. 
We're, we were loved by God. God so loved the world, he gave his only son before we ever turned our hearts to Jesus. But I do believe that our heavenly father delights, rejoices when we become generous, when we learn how to share, when we take what's on us and we take it and we drape it over somebody else and say, can I help that person? I believe it brings delight to the heart of God. So get, let me be very clear as we talk about this, this issue of enough to share. We are not saved by our generosity. We're saved by the grace of Jesus. We are not loved by God because we're generous. But when we're generous, I believe we bring delight and joy to the heart of our Heavenly Father. And I can tell you this, I want to bring joy to the heart of God. And one way I believe we can do that is by growing to be more like Jesus, by learning to be more generous. So word one is when. Word two is delight. God takes delight when we learn to be generous. And word three is sacrifice. Giving, even sacrificially. Look with me at, at 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 6 to 18, we read these words. This is how we know what love is. You want a definition of love? Here's how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That's how you know love. God loves you so much, his only son gave his life on the cross for you. That's how we know love. But now look what comes next. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. We follow the example of Jesus. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us, love, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Now, when he says, let us not love with words or speech, he's not saying, don't speak loving words. That's not the point at all. What he's saying is, don't just speak loving words. Oh, I love you. I care about you. I feel for you. And we never do anything. He's saying, well, then what kind of love is that? But we put with, we put with our words and speech, our actions, and we show the truth of our hearts. We become generous. We share. And so the practice of sharing when you share, it's expected that it brings delight to the heart of God when we share, when we're generous, that we're called to do it sacrificially. We look at Jesus who gave his life, and that's the model for us of how we lay our lives down for others. That should be the life of a follower of Jesus. And oh man, does our world need to see Christians who will sacrifice for others. That's why I'm thrilled that we get to partner with churches in Houston because I see churches there that are sacrificing at a deep level and I wanna see us come alongside and be part of that. Because that's what God's people do. They lay themselves down. They sacrifice like we were sacrificed for by Jesus. And then a fourth word in the practice of sharing, if you're taking notes, is consistent. Write down the word consistent. Consistent. Being consistent in our generosity. Look with me at Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Hit the pause button there. The whole tithe. In the ancient world, people knew what that meant. That meant, that, that meant tenth. Bring a tenth of what you have and give it to God's work. That seems like a lot, but that was, that was the norm back then. Give, give the, and it was always the first tenth. I think I know why God said bring the first tenth and not the last tenth. If you're laughing, you know why too. If you give the last tenth by the time you get end of the month, how much do you have left? Nothing. So if you want to make sure God gets his part, you give him the first tenth. Because you always have the first tenth, you never have the last tenth. So it's, the tithe is that first tenth given to God's work. And then this, the only time the Bible God says this, test me. Only time God says in all the Bible, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. God says, you become generous and, I, you, and you be faithful in this and you be consistent in your generosity. I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. It doesn't always mean more money, but God will bless and bless and bless. Then God says in verse 11, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. And then look, listen to this. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. The world will notice and see. Three things happen when we're consistently sharing and live a generous life. When we, we're consistently sharing and live a generous life, it leads to provision for future sharing. I believe this. I believe that the more generous we are, the more God wants to pour into our lives. Why? Because he knows we're going to be generous. And we be, become a conduit of God's blessing to others. Protection. He said, I'm going to protect your land and protect your crops. It doesn't mean that nothing bad will ever happen to you, but there's a certain way that God protects those who are learning to be generous with what he's given to them. And then it will bring praise and bring glory to God. God will be glorified. God will be exalted. 
Man, the, the idea in our culture, I gotta tell you, in our culture today and in the church today, the idea of saying, I'm gonna take the first 10% of all that God gives to me and give it back to God's work is almost gone. It's almost gone in the church today. And, and remember, I don't think if you tithe or don't tithe, it doesn't change your salvation. It doesn't change that God loves you. It's not, generosity is not about salvation. It's not about God's love. It's about bringing delight to the heart of God and trusting in him in a new way. But I know for, for Sherry and I, this, was part of our, this has been part of our life for the 33 years we've been married. When we first got married, we, we gave faithfully, consistently $10 every week. We made $400 a month. So it was really easy to figure out. $400 a month, that means we make $100 a week, 10 bucks. And every week, every week, every week, Lord, take delight. This is, this is what we give to you. Every week. And that was just part of the rhythm of our life. I learned that from my wife and my wife learned that from her dad. It was a family legacy that was, that was passed on into my life. And we've tried to teach that to our children. That, that you have a rhythm of life that you consistently say every week or every month, I'm giving to God the first from what he's given to me. And, 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 and it becomes a lifestyle and a rhythm. And some people go, I don't, you know, that's not something I can do. One of my favorite, all-time favorite stories, I've shared it before, and you may have heard me share it, but I, it's one of my favorite stories ever. And I, so I'm gonna share it with you one more time. A guy named Peter Marshall. Peter Marshall was actually the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. Powerful pastor, powerful man of prayer. And he was the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. So there were people who were high-level business leaders, political leaders who would go to him for prayer, go to him for wisdom. And this, this very wealthy, well-to-do businessman came to Peter Marshall, said, Pastor Marshall, I have a problem. He says, what's your problem? He says, I can't afford to tithe anymore. He says, what do you mean? He says, well, when I first became a Christian and started giving, I was making 50000 a year. I thought that was a lot of money back then. But I gave, I gave $5,000 every single year. I was careful. I mean, I made 50000 I gave 5000 He says, the problem is, Pastor, I make $5 million a year now. That's $500,000. I can't afford to give that. <laughs> right? Pastor Marshall, Peter Marshall, put his arm around him and said, let me pray for you. Dear God, he prayed, will you reduce this man's income <laughs> all the way down to what it takes for him to afford to be able to tie? And he begins to pray this. In the middle of the prayer, this guy says, Pastor Marshall, stop. Don't pray. Don't pray. It's almost like, take it back. Take it back. You know? um, he says, don't pray that. He was a, Pastor Marshall was a powerful man. He was afraid that God would answer his prayer. <laughs> so he finally says, I can live on $4.5 million. I'm going to be okay. You get the point, right? <laughs> Giving is not about how much we have. It's not. But can I tell you what? I praise God that my wife and I learned in, in, our, in our 20s as newlyweds, $10 a week, $10 a week, and then eventually it was $25 a week. And that's been able to grow over time. But, but faithfully, it, it taught us. And you know, when I look back on that, our $10 a week in the overall church budget, budget of our church was probably not making a real impact. But that rhythm of giving $10 a week changed me. And I believe it delighted the heart of God as much as somebody who gives out of their millions because we were faithful and we gave them our first and we gave them our best. That's, that's the heart of God. And I believe that becomes the heart of his children we understand. So the practice of sharing, it's consistent. It's a rhythm. It's weekly or it's monthly. It's a way that becomes a way of every week or every month saying, Lord, you've been good. I'm giving back to you. So now there's some principles, some basic principles. And I want to I walk through four biblical principles. Again, if you're a note taker, there's a place in your notes for this. But four different principles of sharing that I think are really important and important for us to get in our hearts and our minds. Here's number one. It is always a present and an eternal investment. When you share with what God's given you out of the love of Jesus, it's always a present investment and an eternal investment. 1 Timothy 6, 18 and 19 says this. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. They're talking about us Christians. To be generous and willing to share. This is the, the, in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, for eternity, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Every time a Christian gives out of generosity as God leads them to, whether you give to a person on the street in need, whether you give to the church, whether you give to a mission organization, if you're giving to the work of Jesus, it makes an impact right now, but listen to this, it echoes into eternity. I've often looked at my own life financially I regret a lot of things I've spent money on through the years. I don't regret a penny I've given to the work of Jesus. Not one bit. 
Because all of those things are still echoing into eternity and making an impact for Jesus. So number one principle, it's always a present and eternal investment. Number two, it makes this life more glorious. This life becomes a better life when we learn to live with generosity. Same passage. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Listen to this. So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. It's talking about that, that eternal life, but when you know Jesus, eternal life begins now. When you become a Christian, you're destined for heaven. Your eternal life has already started. And this life becomes true life, life indeed, when we grow in generosity. And when we hold on to and hoard and keep things to ourselves, we lose the joy of life. This, this is why I think that God hates debt so much. You read the Bible, God is not a fan of debt. Why? Because God, Debt handcuffs us and shackles us and steals the ability to be generous. And when you get out, and we have a class that we do here a number of times a year. If you want to be in a, in a financial management class where you can learn personal biblical disciplines of living a wise financial life, go to the Connection Center today and say, hey, put me on a list for the next time we have one of those classes about Christian finances. And if you're not a Christian, a Christian finance class would be a great class for you because it'll show you how God impacts every part of our lives. And, and, and so, principles of sharing... It's always present and eternal. It makes this life more glorious. Number three, it is a sign of where our heart really is. Our ability to be generous and where we invest our finances is a sign of where our heart really is. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 6. We'll start in verse 19. Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But... Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Invest in heavenly things where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. And here's the key. Words of Jesus. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's my heart? My heart is where my treasure is. And if my treasure is all about what I can amass and get now and keep for myself, that's where my heart is. And if my treasure and investment is in something beyond myself, things that last forever, there's two things that last forever, God and people. That's why Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Those two things that form the cross, love God, love people, that is what matters most. That's what lasts forever. So invest in those things that last forever and invest in things of God's kingdom. That's principle number three. And principle number four, what I call reverse math. If you don't like math, you'll love this because it's reverse math. It's kind of a different kind of math. Listen to these words from Proverbs 11. If you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs 11 and listen to these words and watch, watch how backwards this is. Watch how it doesn't make sense. But this is God's way of impacting economy and resources. Verse 24 of Proverbs 11. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, they hold on to everything, and comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper, and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. It's completely backwards. So here's how we think. We think more equals less. Let me explain what I mean by that. If I give more, we think if I give more, I'm going to have less. That's what we think. If, I, if I'm too generous, if I give more, I'm going to have less. We think less equals more. If I give less and I hold on to everything I have, I'm going to have more. I'm just going to stay away from my stuff. And if I, if I hold on to all my stuff, I'm going to have more. But it's exactly the opposite. God's economy says this, more equals more. If I give more away, I'll actually have more. And less equals less. If I give less away, it seems like I should have more, but I actually have less. And I really have experienced this to be true. When we become, when we give away more, we actually have more. I think in a number of ways. I think that God provides more blessings of all sorts. I think also, when we're generous, we enjoy what we have more because we don't feel like we're protecting it all the time. And, and so, and so if, if I'm more generous, I have more. I enjoy what God's given to me. I believe that God provides more for those who are generous so that they can be a conduit of blessing and letting it flow to other people. And I actually believe that the, more, that, that, that the less we are generous, the less we have. We can hardly enjoy what we have because we're spending all of our time protecting what we have instead of really delighting in it. And, and so in God's economy, it's reverse math. Those, those are some basic principles. 
And so I want to just close with a challenge that you would pray for a passion for sharing, that you would pray that God would stir your heart. If you're a follower of Jesus, that your heart would become like the heart of Jesus and you would long to be generous. And if you're not a Christian, understand that part of being a Christian is growing in generosity. So look with me at Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse one. Luke 21 and verse one, it's an amazing story. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow who had two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, Jesus said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Now in that little story, let me tell you what Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying, I only want poor people to give. He's not saying the gift of a poor person honors God more than the gift of a rich person. I believe what Jesus is saying in this passage is, it doesn't matter how much you have, you can be generous. It doesn't matter how much you have. Give out of what you have. Give with joy. Give your first. Give, give with growing generosity. I'm absolutely convinced that 33 years ago, when Sherry and I were this young couple, going backwards financially every month, we were actually going in the hole every single month, but every week, $10. Every week, $10. That was our, that was our call. That was our, that was our first tenth. That's what we gave. I believe that that brought God just as much delight and joy as what we give today. If I was giving $10 a week now, or if I was giving $100 a week now, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be the same because God's giving us more. We've had to keep looking and saying, what is generous for us? What does that look like? And keep adjusting how we can give but I believe, that, I believe that, that 33 years ago, God took delight in our generosity, and I believe that today God takes delight in our generosity. The amount has changed, but our hearts are what matter. And our hearts are to be generous toward the things of God and to forward the work of the kingdom of God in this world that so needs what only Jesus can bring. I think of a, a woman who's been part of this church for years. When she first came to Shoreline, she was living on the streets, and, and eventually she was living in a trailer, and eventually now she's got a little one-bedroom of an apartment that she rents. But when she, was still, when she was kind of in between living on the streets and being in an apartment, uh, she was living in a trailer. And I remember it was going to be kind of a rainy season. And she went out and she bought a bunch of blue tarps from Home Depot to set up on rainy days for people that she knew that were still living on the streets. And that was her act of generosity. For you, buying four or five blue tarps might not be a big sacrifice. It was for her at that time. And God took delight. It doesn't matter if you're 12 or 92, it doesn't matter if you are on you know, government-funded, limited income, or you have va you know, massive holdings financially. It's the same for all of us. God takes delight when we grow generous. And listen closely. Please hear this. Our salvation is not bound in what we give. And God's love for us is not bound in what we give. But we can bring delight to the heart of our Father. And I think that every single time every one of his children. Look at someone else next to them whose blanket has fallen off their lap, who's in a time of need, and takes their blanket and kind of drapes over that person's legs and says, what can I do? How can I serve? How can I help? Heaven rejoices and God is glorified. And that's the invitation of God. So here's what I want to do. In the closing moments, I want to just give you a couple challenges. You're going to see these on the screen. You can write these down. Four challenges. Ask for the heart of Jesus. Number one, say, Jesus, give me your heart. Let me love like you love, feel like you feel, give like you give. Number two, give regularly. Make it a discipline. Make it a lifestyle. For Sherry and I, we like to give monthly. And we're old-fashioned. So we actually give a check in an envelope. And it's just the old-fashioned way of doing things these days. Some of you give every week or every month on, on, your, on your app, on your phone. We have a, an app that you can use here, and you can just give that way. Some of you do a regular giving uh, online, and you just kind of set it up for a month, a month of the year, whatever it is. But there's something about that rhythm. I want to challenge you at least every week or every month to look at how God has blessed you and give something. And watch what happens to your heart and watch how God uses that for his glory. Number three, grow in generosity. Wherever you are in your giving, say, Lord, how can we be more generous? That has been a journey for Sherry and I for 33 years, and we keep asking that question. Every year, Lord, is there a way we can be more generous? And if we don't have more, it does, generosity doesn't mean more stuff or more giving. It means more generous in our hearts and giving more of what it is we have to help others and to bless others and to glorify God. And then number four, invest in eternal things. 
and invest in the things that matter and that last forever. If you're visiting at Shoreline here from another church, I want to challenge you when you go back home to be faithful in your giving to your local church. The local church is the primary way that God is seeking to change this world and bring blessing to this world. I think of Houston right now and it's local churches that are rallying people to come and serve. And so we'll share some ways that you can be part of that by going and serving, by giving, and we'll share that with you. But just faithfully giving wherever you call your church home, make it a rhythm of life and watch how God blesses others and watch how God blesses you. Lord Jesus, we pray for generous hearts. God, I know that I can't stand here and preach and I can't change anyone's heart and I can't make anyone become generous. But I also know, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you can and that you love to stir hearts and move hearts and change people's lives. And so, Lord, I pray for every single person who calls Shoreline Church their church home, every person who's visiting with us who is online right now in other churches, I pray that you would give us a rhythm of generosity and a heart that loves to give. And we would see you adding up things in heaven, souls and people and, and just great things for eternity because we've been generous in this life. Stir our hearts, move within us and be glorified.